Good evening from the Gambia. My name is Jaria Tijalo. I'm your session host. Um, this final round is the lightning talk. Um, there are a lot of topics, so I'm just going to read all of them and we will play the recorded video. The first talk is going to be on building a free worldwide long distance hiking trail map together with OpenStreetMap. The second is OpenStreetMap in the Philippines 2021. The third is localizing community support through regional hubs. The third is automatic building detection with OSM to label and tons of flow. The R is ORS2, the QGIS plugin for the open route service. The last is OpenStreetMap in support of UN peacekeeping mission, unit maps, and UN mappers. Uh, sorry, the last one is water and sanitation mapping in Nairobi, informal settlement. So um, there's not going to be any question and answers, but yeah, let's hear them out. Thank you. What's up, everybody? It's your boy, Davey, getting it poppin'. Thanks for coming to my video. Today, I'm talking about building a free worldwide long-distance hiking trail map together with OpenStreetMap. So as it turns out, we have a lot of long-distance hiking trails that have been added to the map by our worldwide community. These trails are relations that have type equals route and route equals hiking, and then as their members have highway ways, which ideally have a surface and sack scale attached. Then there's also type equals super route, which is a hierarchical relation allowing us to break down trails into different route sections. So a lot of times we want to go from the raw data, which is individual way segments, into a single continuous line string. Why do we want to do that? Well, in particular, it unlocks elevation profiles, accurate route length, line simplification, and in general is a much better way to represent the trail as a single continuous line. The problem is we got a lot of incomplete data. There's a lot of relations that are accidentally broken all the time, and sometimes incorrect route topology prevents us from routing the trail into a single continuous line. So how do we improve and maintain the quality of these hiking route relations worldwide? That's what I want to present today, which is superroute.org, a tool to help us do that. So this is kind of how it works. I don't have time to get into the details, but basically it's built on OpenStreetMap, AWS, Terrain Tiles, and Wikidata, which are all public and free data sources. So this is what the homepage looks like. And then in the top left corner, you've got the Route Explorer. And if you click on Country, you'll get this page, which is a trail index that has all the Wikidata records that have instance of long distance trail, country, continent, and OSM relation ID set. And then once you click on one of these trails, it will download the trail from the Overpass API and then display it on the map. Then you've got the Trail DB over here, which is a bit different. That's a curated list of long distance hiking trails that are cached to ensure routability in case they're accidentally broken, and then also include selected nearby POIs that are relevant for hiking. So the trail life cycle, once the trail becomes routable, it always stays routable, and then once 100% of the member ways have surface and sack scale attached, then it becomes complete. That's also what you see in the background here. These, All these trails are trails that are in the database and that are routable. So once you click on one of those trails, then you get an interactive map that you can browse around and see what all the relevant POIs. And then on the info panel, this is the Wikipedia extract, and then this is some data from Wikidata. Then you've got the elevation profile and some elevation statistics. Then in the route panel, you've got a breakdown of the member ways by sack scale, surface, and highway. And then you've also got this download button. This download button, get, you can get it in a bunch of different formats, but I want to highlight in particular this download for organic maps such that you can go on your mobile offline and you can get the route with all of the points of interest that are broken down by category and that include 100% of the data that is available in OSM that may be relevant for you as you go hiking. So then you've got the improved data button, which allows you to open up all the ways that either don't have sack scale or don't have a uh, surface. And you can use satellite imagery or if you uh, know the trail yourself or uh, street view in order to add that information. Then there's the POI menu. So how that works is basically there's a selector that uses overpass um, and also the max distance available from the trail. So basically it selects all the mountain passes that are less than 100 meters from the trail are included in the POI list. And so also you can switch the different languages, which will give you everything in a different language. The interface is translatable, but then also it gives you the information from Wikipedia and Wikidata that is translated and internationalized. So this is all of the country names that are in Spanish. Then there's the 3D view, which allows you to visualize the trails in 3D, which I think is extremely dope. So I highly recommend checking that out. And then, so when you click on an unroutable trail, it's a bit different because you don't get the download. And then also there's the show error button. Once you click on that, it'll show you all the reasons that the trail is not routable and then give you some links to open it up in Jossam or ID. And so what I like to do is open up two separate layers. One is the route relation and then one is the error node so that you can see which re regions to focus on to help fix the, the trail. 
Then once you do fix the trail a bit, you can click the refresh data button and that will give you a live data from the overpass API. So you kind of have a conversation with the OSM API as you work to improve the quality of the, the data. So then there's also a trail DB change log. So the trail DB is hosted fully in GitHub and you can see every day who has made the changes and what change sets they have. And then also uh, understand a bit what the status of the whole trail DB is. Every trail has a permalink and same thing with all the languages. Um, also, if you go to superroute.org slash wanderlust.kml, you'll get a specific KML file for organic maps that will have all of the long distance trails in the trail database that are routable such that you can navigate and, uh, you know, go on whatever trail that you want. And they are simplified a little bit, but they're good enough for navigation. So the state of the long distance hiking trail map in 2021, we have a lot of trails that are routable all worldwide, but I really want to get the Continental Divide, Greater Patagonia, Greater Himalaya Trail, Te Araroa North, and Via Alpina Red. I really hope that we can bring the long distance hiking trail community together in order to get these trails routable. So we can improve the data for the benefit of all, and you can help in a lot of different ways. But if you're in particular want to be a part of a worldwide community of long distance hiking trail enthusiasts, you can join the OSM Long Distance Hiking Club, which is basically just a telegram group with me in it. And it would make my day if someone joined it, honestly. Um, and also, I will totally send you one of these patches, which I personally think are extremely dope uh, if you want to help out and uh, make some of these trails routable throughout the world. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and uh, I'll see you on the trail. Sambale from the Philippines. I work at Mapbox as a data specialist and I started contributing to OpenStreetMap around 2006. Part ng OpenStreetMap yung concept ng tinatawag nating community mapping. When I look at the yung, yung wiki nila, yung website, it's an it's an free map for for everyone um, uh, globally. So tiningnan ko yung Pilipinas and then I was disappointed kasi walang laman yung yung data sa Pilipinas. Sa Pilipinas, particularly sa cities natin like Metro Manila, mahalaga yung maayos na topoplano, especially sa local government. Pagka meron kang maayos na base map, magagamit mo to sa lahat ng aspect ng planning. Like for example, sa, sa traffic, sa urban planning, sa pag-identify ng poverty, and so on. Nung umpisa, nakakaunti yung mga volunteers natin, nag-expand siya at dumawak na yung volunteers ng open street map. Halimbawa si Faye, na dati kong katrabaho kung saan inintroduce ko sa kanya yung open street map dun sa aming trabaho. Isa na siya sa mga advocate natin dun sa project. At sa ngayon siya na yung youth ambassador sa, sa Asia na patuloy na nagpo-promote yung open street map hindi lang dito sa Pilipinas but across the region. I'm Faye Andal, one of the regional ambassadors of Youth Mappers and a volunteer of OpenStreetMap Philippines. So we regularly conduct mapathons, trainings, and mapping parties and invite students to join us and participate with our mapping initiatives. And ngayon, uh, na-enjoy ko yung pagtitrain sa mga students kasi sila yung mas tech-savvy, sila din yung mas interested on mapping, and nabibuild ko din kasi yung skills nila on mapping. Ngayong pandemic, naging very useful yung OpenStreetMap data for research analysis ng iba't ibang organizations. Katulad ng UP Resilience Institute Pandemic Response Team na nakipag-partner with Hot Philippines para maimapa yung building footprint sa Quezon City and malaman kung anong level of community quarantine yung dapat i-implement ng government. Maraming gumagamit ng OpenStreetMap for their analysis on disaster risk reduction and management and meron ding mga communities na ginagamit yung OpenStreetMap for their advocacy, katulad ng MapBex ni Namiko and Don. I am Don Leongson. I'm one of the 13 core volunteers of MapBex. Ako rin yung gender focal person para sa MapBex. Ang MapBex ay isang online community of volunteers advocating for LGBT representation and inclusion in various mapping platforms including the OSM. Ang HIV facilities mapping ay isa sa mga pinaka-importanteng proyekto ng MapDex ang ngayon bilang bahagi ng humanitarian response, lalong-lalo na kapag dating ng disaster. Ginagamit ang datos dito sa proyekto na ito ng mga PLHIV, ng mga aid support groups at iba't ibang mga organisasyon para makapag-identify ng mga HIV facilities, kagaya ng testing centers, ng mga social hygiene clinics, 
at iba pang nagbibigay ng mga medical and psychosocial support services para sa PLHIV. Maaari ring magamit ang OSM sa iba't ibang paraan, gaya ng hobbies, humanitarian action, and environmental protection kagaya ng Kisir Al. Ako po pala si Al Wahab Harun, isang JIS freelancer dito sa Bangsamoro, Autonomous Region and Muslim Mindanao. So, ako po ay nagmamapa at nagbibigay ng technical assistance sa mga agency at local government dito po sa BARM. Importante po ito sa sa BARM kasi ngayon, ang problema po sa BARM is kulang po yung mga data regarding sa mga existing land resource uses o kaya yung mga lokasyon ng kagaya ng mga turismo at saka iba pong mga protection and conservation areas dito sa BARM. In-encourage ko po yung agencies dito sa BARM, especially po yung mga youth. Sa mga LGUs, na sa pagplano nila sa kanilang comprehensive land use plan at saka yung Provincial Development Physical Framework Plan. Uh, nakatutuwang isipin na marami ng volunteers na nagko-contribute at patuloy na nagpapalawak ng project sa Pilipinas. Marami na tayong nagawa doon sa paglawak ng data na sa OpenStreetMap sa, sa Pilipinas. Nakarating na to sa iba't ibang bahagi ng Pilipinas. Pero ang sa akin, ang pangarap ko para doon sa community ay mas maging inclusive at diverse kung saan yung mga volunteers they can express their opinions and views for the project na magagamit nila sa kanilang mga advocacy at mga community. At magagawa natin to sa pamamagitan ng mga volunteers na meron tayo sa project kaya nila Faye, ni Don at ni Al na patuloy na nagmamapa at pinapalawak yung advocacy ng mapping sa kanilang mga communities. Hi, greetings from Kampala. My name is Geoffrey Katerega from OSM Africa, from OSM Uganda, and working with the humanitarian open Sweet map team as the community manager at the Eastern and Southern Africa uh, Open Mapping Hub. So last year, the OSM Foundation shared some wonderful news. Uh, they introduced the active computer membership that allows uh, people who are not able to pay the annual membership fee of 15 pounds uh, to become official members of the foundation. Uh, this allows them to be able to uh, influence the direction of OpenStreetMap by being able to vote in the elections of the leadership of the foundation. Um, the statistics show that there was an increase in membership in the different parts of the world, but we also see that there is still very low levels of representation in some parts of the world like Africa, Asia, Oceania, and South America. So there are not enough people contributing to OpenStreetMap from this part of the world and need to look into the reasons why. OpenStreetMap should be the map that anyone, anywhere can engage with and contribute to, uh, which is not the case at the moment. So what are the barriers to participation and how can we help communities and contributors overcome these barriers? Uh, through OSM Africa, uh, we conducted a survey last year uh, where we asked uh, OSM community leaders the challenges that they face in their community. And these are also some of the barriers to participation. So lack of access to devices uh, like laptops and, and smartphones. Um, not everyone can really afford these. Uh, lack of access to reliable internet, uh, which is actually also very expensive here. Um, little awareness about OpenStreetMap, um, especially when you look into the country where there is currently no communities and not very not many people are aware about OpenStreetMap. Uh, the language barrier, uh, most of the resources around OpenStreetMap are in English and not everyone can really uh, speak the language. Um, lack of a space uh, with internet access, with tables uh, for meetups and trainings. Um, low volunteer retention rates, so groups are putting in efforts to recruit volunteers to open sheet map, but many don't stay long enough to become active contributors. So uh, we need to look into uh, these barriers and work with communities to try and uh, remove them or to reduce them. 
So to help communities overcome some of these barriers, the humanitarian open map team is opening up regional hubs uh, to be able to localize community support as each region in the world faces unique challenges. So the hubs for Eastern and Southern Africa and the one for Asia Pacific uh, have already started work and the progress is on to set up other two in uh, West Africa and Latin America. So the hubs will engage and support local mapping communities in up to 94 countries. One of the goals of the uh, regional hubs is really to support the growth of vibrant and sustainable OSM communities uh, who can raise the resources they need uh, to engage their local volunteers, to grow uh, local aids to the map, as well as engage with government, uh, with humanitarian and government partners, to be able to use OSM data uh, in decision making to help solve local challenges. So this will be done through uh, investing in communities through provision of grants, uh, like we have been doing through the micro grant program, and through collaboration on projects. Um, it will also be done by uh, supporting uh, community events uh, like the State of the Map Africa uh, Conference, uh, the OSM Africa Monthly Mapathon, and also to support locally organized uh, events and meetups uh, by investing in. Um, technology so that we have tools that make it easier for people to easily contribute to OpenStreetMap. Um, by growing partnerships between OpenStreetMap communities and humanitarian and development actors so that the data generated is made is more useful. Um, most importantly, by investing in capacity building, um, not only in GIS and mapping, but in also other skills like volunteer engagement, fundraising, finance management, communications, uh, leadership development. The good news is that most of these skills are already exist in some communities in the region. And what we need to do is to invest in peer-to-peer -to -peer learning uh, so as to facilitate knowledge exchange from one community to another. So if you're not same community uh, member, a contributor from any of these countries, um, would really like to connect with you and work together to grow OpenStreetMap in the region. And let's work together to grow uh, the number of active computers in the region and make OpenStreetMap uh, more representative geographically. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Latin talk series of the State of Map 2021. My name is Holly, and I'm from Heidelberg University, Germany. Um, today, my talk is about automatic building detection with Awesome 2 Label and TensorFlow. First, as an introduction of the Awesome API and Awesome 2 Label. Awesome API was developed by the colleagues in Highgate, and it's a generic web API for in-depth analysis of OpenStreetMap data with a special focus on its full historical data sets. And some core functions of Awesome includes OSM data aggregation, historical data extraction, OSM user contribution statistics. So built upon this Awesome API, our Awesome to Label package converts the historical OSM features into valid geospatial machine learning training samples. And all these two projects is open source in GitHub, and you can find the links as follow. And, and at the package description of our Awesome to Label, um, first we offer the um, the users uh, easy configuration, and the users is free to configure their interested OSM features by identifying the OSM key and um, value pair, um, and then they also um, can define their areas of interest by giving a GeoJSON file, and then the Awesome to Label would download the OSM data by querying the Awesome API and clip the OSM geometries into tiles and, and convert it into tile based annotations and also download the corresponding satellite image. By combining the annotations and satellite image, our Awesome to Label automatically generates the training samples for the modern uh, 
deep learning um, frameworks. For example, with this COCO-like annotation, one can easily train their building detection models via the TensorFlow Object Detection API. So as an example, we have released a, a workthrough with our awesome 2 level and TensorFlow in the GitHub page, uh, for which we select um, an area in Tanzania, and we noticed uh, there was several finished human terror mapping tasks. So we applied our um, workthrough there. We first download the satellite image and the OSM data, put them together and convert it to training samples, and then fit it into the TensorFlow Object Detection API with a pre-trained model. And after you get your trained building detection model, you can apply it to the satellite image and you can expect some um, example results uh, as you can see here. And, and within the workthrough, we also offer you the scripts of converting the uh, your predictions into um, exact geographical locations and also validate the results against the OSM data. So welcome to try out our workthrough in the GitHub and leave us uh, uh, comments or issues if you feel it's interesting or if you find some um, uh, difficulties to run it, we will be happy to uh, help out. And a few words about uh, future works. Um, we are now working on extending this automatic building detection work through in Africa. Um, uh, the major idea is to train the, uh, train the model um, in the areas where OSM data is rather complete and then apply this model to the unseen areas or the data sparse areas where um, OSM built building features is highly missing. And uh, in such a manner, we hope to help the community, help the volunteers to know where they should put their um, mapping effort and where they should map um, for the next time. Um, and I would like to thanks for your attention. And um, there is also a blog post about um, our Latin talk. Um, if you have, uh, if you would like, feel free to check it out. And uh, um, we would be happy for any feedbacks. Um, and I also wish you a happy conference. So bye. Hello everybody, my name is Jakob Schnell, I am an employee of the Heidelberg Institute for Geoinformation Technology and today I want to give an overview of the QGIS plugin ORS tools to access the Open Root Service. I assume that everybody is familiar with uh, the geoinformation system QGIS and the Open Source Routing Engine Open Root Service, so I won't go into any detail about that, but instead dive right in. I have QGIS already opened and if we want to use ORS tools, of course, we first have to install it. We click on plugins and manage and install plugins, search for ORS tools and install the plugin, which I've already done. We can then open it. And the first thing we have to do is uh, we have to get up an API key. This is what it would look like if I hadn't set some stuff already. We get an API key for the open root service by clicking on sign up and following the instructions. I click on the cogwheel, enter our API key here and are then ready to go. The main thing we want to do with a routing engine is, of course, root. We can do this from the main view by clicking on the green plus. We then click on points. We want to root via. Let's start in Heidelberg, where I live. And let's say we want to go to Ludwighafen, where I take a singing lesson. Right, so we double click to set the last point, our end point. And we have a list of points here. And we can choose uh, what mode of travel we want. Cycling, by foot, driving. Let's be lazy. Let's just drive a car, click apply, and are met with a root output, right? That we can, of course, uh, toggle here. Now, let's say that uh, we know that Mannheim is always a bit of a stress because it's rather full, right? So we want to avoid um, the inner parts of Mannheim. I have set up a polygon that encompasses Mannheim completely. And what we can do, if we click on our plugin again, is go to advanced configurations and avoid a polygon, it will automatically select the one that we have, we can avoid Mannheim and we click apply and get a second route that will route around Mannheim, right? Cool. 
So let's say um, my car is broken um, and I have to borrow the Vespa from my little brother. Uh, so we can do that as well by saying avoid tags. And what the Vespa can't do is it can't go on highways. So we avoid any highways, right? We still are maybe now going through Mannheim is okay because we have a smaller vehicle, so it's easier. And we click apply again. And we can see the route that is going down here via Schwetzing and avoiding any highways. Right, so these are some of the features, the main the main view, but the plugin does not only have this one, but it's also available as a processing plugin via the batch job tabs uh, here. And one example for that is uh, the isochrones endpoint of the open root service. We can calculate isochrones from a single point to choose a point. We uh, click on those three dots here and then on the map, let's say we start in Heidelberg again. And we can then set some options. So maybe let's do some foot walking isochrones um, and let's see what is in five, 10, 15, and maybe 20 and maybe 25 minutes around this one point. We click run down here. We see that it is done. We can have a look at our isochrones and those are our walking isochrones around some point in Heidelberg. Let's have a look on how a processing layers works. Um, and for that, I have chosen the start and end point of yesterday's, today's, tomorrow's Tour de France etap, which has a length of 193 kilometers. But as we know, they choose a route that the organizers think is suitable, and we want to choose the fastest route, right? So we go to our batch jobs again, which is the directions points one layer uh, algorithm, because we only have one layer. And I have set up those two points with an order, so we know what is the start and the end point. Um, of course, we don't use a car, but we go by bike, and we know that the area is quite hilly, so uh, let's choose a mountain bike. Of course, we want to go fast, and then we can run this as well. This is the route that we get from here, and we can have a short look at how long that is by just looking at the attributes table and we see that is 138 kilometers compared to the around 190 kilometers of the attack, the stage. Right, so that was a short overview of the Cugus plugin. Uh, it is not completely feature complete, but it is well maintained. So if you need something, say something, open an issue in our repository that you can find in the About tab down here. Thanks a lot. Hi everyone, I am Michael Montani and I work as a JS consultant at the United Nations Global Service Center. And today we will speak about Unite Maps and UN Mappers. I guess you all know the work the UN peacekeepers are doing. They work with all their efforts to build the conditions for a lasting peace in conflict areas. And they do this by patrolling uh, unsecured war areas and providing military support to local communities, uh, setting up IDP camps and providing support also to the food and healthcare systems. Not all of you know they use OpenStreetMap on a daily basis, and they do this through Unite Maps. Unite Maps is an initiative led by the UNJC, and it is an application mixing uh, OpenStreetMap based map data together with UN authoritative sources for the sensible information like boundary uh, and uh, village names. So the, the application is providing background contextual information plus a collection of satellite imagery, a three-dimensional visualization of OpenStreetMap data, uh, a visualization of operational activities for the field missions, plus is providing support for routing and geocoding. All of this is fueled by the Maps on Demand application, which is developed internally by the UNGSC. So uh, having a look to the Unite Maps application, it pretty uh, looks like uh, Google Maps, but it uses OpenStreetMap data and UN data, and it is, use it is usable only uh, by the UN personnel. Regarding the Maps on Demand, uh, this web application is enab enabling also non-GIS UN personnel to print out their cartographic products. They can choose between topographic 50K and 10K maps, urban maps and site maps, so they can modify the settings of the final product they would like to print and export the products as PDF files. And then they can also print the final product with, printer, with plotters in the, in the missions. 
So the UN is not only using OpenStreetMap data, but also editing it. And as you can see, we are editing all the uh, topographic information, including highways, waterways, village information, land cover and land use. And we do this with 13 GIS consultants that are editing on a daily basis the, uh, the map. In two years, we uh, mapped over 160,000 uh, uh, kilometers squared of, uh, of topographic areas in five different uh, areas like uh, Somalia, Mali, Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of the Congo, and the region of ABA. We don't do this only with paid editing, but also leveraging crowdsourcing, um, giving the possibility to any volunteer in the world to give uh, their contribution for the UN peacekeeping missions. And we do this with the UN Mappers community. The UN Mappers is a global community of uh, mapping enthusiasts coming from a range of different sectors. We have people from the UN, so agencies and missions, uh, and especially GIS and the information management working groups and uniformed personnel that are taking field data, uh, plus uh, students and professors from the academia world, so from uh, high schools, universities and research centers all over the world. Um, we also interact with local communities, which are a key component of UN mappers, as uh, they are the final recipients of the data that we are editing and um, and also we do capacity building in order to create sustainable communities. And then we have also all the remote volunteers in the world. So the way we do crowdsourcing is to first educate the mappers. So we believe that high quality data can come only from expert mappers. So we do training and give continuous feedback to remote volunteers. Plus we create editing guidelines and documentation in different languages, including English, French, Italian, and Spanish. And uh, we are going also to open an internship program. Uh, soon we will be releasing the Unite Maps Learning Hub, which is a modal uh, platform in which we are hosting all the educational material that we created up to now. And the second step is obviously to do the contribution. So we do quality control of the edits coming from the community, as well as organizing data imports from UN databases, obviously with the consensus of the OSM community. And you can find our projects on the Tasking Manager. We are on the hot Tasking Manager, and you can find all the instructions in different languages. After that, you can join us. Uh, we are looking for uh, uh, partnerships uh, uh, with many different stakeholders then we are going to uh, implement quick impact projects, which, which are a specific way for the UN peacekeeping missions to fund the local communities. And you can stay in touch with us on all our social media platforms. Uh, soon we will be releasing also the UN Mappers official website. And uh, up to now you can uh, get in touch uh, uh, with us through all the social media and uh, also join our uh, Discord server to have a direct communication with the team. Checking the statistics, we have more than 1,300 UN mappers contributing uh, um, to our projects and we ingested a lot of data together. So don't lose the opportunity to map the world supporting peace and serving humanity with UN mappers. Thank you. My name is uh, Peter Genga. I work with Map Kibera. So late last year, we managed to apply for a grant uh, from uh, OSMF, and uh, we were supposed to conduct a mapping exercise uh, for water and sanitation in informal settlements, specifically uh, Kibera and Madari. So one of the major purposes for the mapping was actually to have an update of uh, the water and sanitation facilities in Kibera and Mandare. Uh, since we know over the years there have been many changes, for example uh, road demolitions, which uh, greatly affect the water connections and the pipes. And uh, we also had uh, issues of fire outbreaks in the region which are frequent. And also there were other issues on uh, management of the facilities, others have been, having been run down for one reason or another. So there was great need to make an update of this uh, data on OpenStreetMap. So another major purpose for the mapping 
was actually to map the water distribution within uh, the two areas of Kibera and Madare. Um, there was this projection uh, during the start of the pandemic that uh, informal settlements in Nairobi would be greatly affected. So we needed to show uh, how the how the areas uh, have uh, access water and sanitation facilities. And also with regards to this, um, we were able to map uh, and show the distribution of uh, the distribution of uh, hand wash points which were installed in the areas. Since uh, there's this uh, perception that uh, areas in former settlements lack water, so we through the hand wash, uh, map, mapping and showing of the hand wash distribution points, we were able to show uh, which areas were able to access uh, these water 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 points in order to keep up with the protocols which are stated by the Ministry of Health uh, of uh, regular hand washing in order to curb the spread of the COVID-19 virus. So we also managed to do a, a survey and uh, some of the questions of the survey were, first of all, we were asking the residents if they were able to access water. Another was that uh, if the water uh, was more costly than before, and another question was that uh, since the, during the start of the pandemic, there was water sh shortages um, in some parts of Nairobi. So we were asking them um, if the people had to go uh, the same distance or cover a longer distance in accessing water. And also in regards to the same, um, the government through the Nairobi Metropolitan Services managed to drill boreholes in certain uh, villages in Kibera and Madare. We were also asking the people if uh, they were able to access these uh, free water services which are provided by the government through the Nairobi Metropolitan Service. Through the mapping exercise, we were able to uh, train 20 youths from both locations of Kibera and Madari uh, with great consideration to gender balance. And also uh, the training equipped them with uh, skills on data collection and open street map. And also uh, we were providing a small stipend for all the mappers and uh, this was a great boost because uh, most of them had lost their jobs and uh, some of them had closed their businesses due to the COVID-19 pandemic and this was a great boost for them since uh, they were able to meet their basic needs and provide for their families also. And uh, some of the findings were that uh, we realized that uh, areas like Madare, Madare Area 3B um, residents of this area actually lack uh, toilets within their homesteads or plots as they call them. So this meant that they were forced to use the public toilets, uh, which was a great challenge because uh, first of all they had to pay for them and also uh, the government had imposed uh, curfews which, re which ran from uh, 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. So this meant that uh, during this curfew period, the residents of these areas were able to access uh, toilet facilities uh, within their reach. So uh, I would like to apologize, uh, this recording was made in Kibera and uh, there are a few distractions here and there, so don't be bothered by them, uh, thank you. So uh, I would like to apologize. Good evening uh, everyone, thank you so Kibera. very much for joining. And, uh, this is the end of the second there, part so of the session for the uh, programming. Um, we will now take a break. The next, will, the next session after the break will start at 2000 UTC, that's 8 p.m. UTC. Uh, wherever you join, just check your um, time zone. Bye for now. Thank you.